This is Charlotte Talks. I'm Mike Collins. Mass shootings have become commonplace in America. Last year, there were 417 mass shootings in the United States, more shootings than there were days in the year. These tragedies used to shock us, stop us, shake us to the core. Now, their frequency has caused many to become inured to them, except those whose loved ones are taken by these acts of senseless violence. For them, the pain will always be there, even as their loved one is missing. How do we remember those taken from us? How do we honor them? How do we deal with our own grief and take the negativity of that experience and turn it into something positive? The answer, of course, is highly individualized, but this hour we'll hear from those who have unfortunately had to confront those questions and make those decisions. Manuel Oliver lost his son, Joaquin, when the shooting broke out at Marjorie Stoneman Douglas High School in Parkland, Florida. Part of his process has been to create a one-man play about his son called Guac, My Son, My Hero, and he will be performing it one night only tonight at the Underground on Hamilton Street near the Music Factory, and he joins us in our Spirit Square studio for the hour. Welcome to the program. Welcome to Charlotte. Thank you for having me here. You're welcome. We're also joined by Trevor Wild. He's a graduate of Marjorie Stoneman Douglas and founder of March for Our Lives Orlando and the Southeast Regional Director of March for Our Lives. And he joins us by phone from his dorm room, I believe, at the, uh, the University of uh, Central Florida. Welcome. Thank you for having me. You're very welcome. Later in the program, we'll hear from the mother of Riley Howell, who lost his life in the shooting last year at UNC Charlotte. And if you would like to join our conversation, you can email us at charlottetalks at wfae.org or search for WFAE on Facebook. Get to us through Twitter at Charlotte Talks. You say, Manuel, that prior to February 14th, uh, 2018, you had the perfect life. You and your wife uh, emigrated from Venezuela. Uh, years before that, uh, not an easy transition, I would imagine, for somebody coming from any country to the United States. How was your life perfect? Well, um, it was pretty um, easy to to define it as a perfect life. Uh, my two kids were happy. Uh, Joaquin was playing basketball and he was enjoying uh, a lot of time with the family. I had a nice job. Um, that I quit on February 15th. Mm. And, um, and my wife had a great job also. So um, we, we really thought at some point that the American dream was true, that it, that it really exists, that you can really come from another country that, that has its own issues. And, and if you work hard and, and you don't worry about yourself but your, your kids and the future of the kids so they can be safe, they can grow up in a nice environment. Uh, things will be okay. Life will give you that award, that reward. But um, it's not like that. It, that changed it in, in, in one day on, on Valentine's Day. So for you, the American dream is not true? Well, in my particular case, it's not. Um, I'm living a nightmare now. Um, but I decided to stay here. Yeah. Now I am... Now I belong more to the United States than, than any time before. You quit your job. You said your wife had a great job, too. Did she quit her job? Uh, yes. Uh, it, took, it took her a little longer. For me, it was a no-brainer. I couldn't. There is no way for anyone that goes through what, what we went through to go back to your regular life. And unless you are really okay with what happens here, there is no way that you can do that. Seventeen young people, I believe that's the number, uh, lost their lives in that shooting at Correct. Parkland. How, how, how well acquainted are you with the stories of the other families involved? <clears throat> we differ in terms of um, the reaction. Uh, some of us are good friends and we have the same uh, response. We, we think that we're, we pointed the same problem. Put it that way, and some others didn't. So, but you don't have to um, agree in everything that you do after this. Actually, I respect a lot anyone that has gone through this, and whatever the reaction is, is is his or her reaction, and it's legit. Uh, you also have a daughter. Uh, how is she? Uh, Andrea is uh, she's 27 years old. Mm -hmm. She's been going through a lot. Uh, I, I remember she, she's not getting involved uh, that much with what we do. So I told her once, 
how, how come you're not involved? I see other kids doing a lot of things with us. And she said, yes, but those other kids haven't lost their brother. So, so since that day, I understand that she also has her own way of reacting to all this. Just so people understand your family unit a little bit better, I'm not sure, when you read things, you don't know if they're true or not, but you can confirm or deny this. Ruth uh, Fireberg, who writes about your one-man show in Playville, which is the, uh, uh, the uh, uh, magazine that you get when you sit down in a theater seat, says that your family unit of four became the center of your universe. Joaquin, your son, became your best friend, and the feeling was mutual. Tell me about him. He was 17 years old. Tell me about Joaquin. Joaquin was my best friend, um, and I'm not bringing that just because it sounds good. Mm-hmm. Uh, when, you, when we moved here, I've been here for 17 years in this country. Joaquin was three years old. Okay. So I had no other friend. I, don't had, I didn't have a network to hang out with. So I had my son to, to try to be the best possible father, and then we created this friendship that, for me, had no, I mean, it was prizes. So that explains why I keep saying that Joaquin was my best friend. I, if I went to the movies, I went with Joaquin. If I went to the steakhouse, I will go with Joaquin. And he, he kept growing and became that young man um, with his own uh, taste for things and music. But, but we did a lot of things together. That also explains why it's for me so easy to have a one-man show that speaks about my son. Right. Because I'm, I'm describing my best friend, and I know him so well that it becomes easy. Almost from the minute of that tragedy, because you quit your job the very next day, you've been working toward work, working through your own dealing with this and finding ways to honor Joaquin. I, I, I'm told that you were a creative director and an artist by trade, and so the first thing that you did was start painting murals around the country, memorials to your son, whose nickname was Guac, hence the name of your play, Guac, My Son, My Hero. Uh, you had an outlet, you had a way to express this intolerable grief that swept over you as, as, a way to, as a way to honor your son. You could do this artwork, and now you have this one-man play that you've gotten uh, a lot of help with, but we'll, and we'll talk about that. But in the absence of those creative outlets, what might you have been able to do or not do? Where would you be today? I don't know. Probably not here. Um, I, I, there's only one thing that you, you missed on your uh, definition of what I've been doing, that these are not memorials. These are statements from Joaquin. Okay. So uh, one thing that we decided as parents, me and Patricia, is that we had the right to still be parents and protect our son. And, and, and because I know him so well, I know what he will be demanding and what he will be saying. So how do we put that idea into a graphic way that everyone can see it? It's not by, by me posting a, a tweet and then because it won't reach enough people. I'm an artist myself. I love street art and I love the power that art has. So we make these huge statements on amazing murals. We have done 38 so far. We have been traveling, you name it, almost everywhere. And we bring what Joaquin needs to tell to that community that probably also suffered gun violence at some point. Mm-hmm. And, and that gets us involved in a way that we support others, but also we receive support from others. So Joaquin, through you, uh, is still having an impact and having an impact on something that uh, a lot of young people embraced immediately following this tragedy. Trevor Wilde is a graduate of uh, Marjorie Stoneman Douglas and the founder, as I said at the very beginning of the program, uh, of March for Our Lives Orlando and the regional director of the, uh, for the Southeast of March for Our Lives. You had already been a graduate uh, of, um, of uh, Marjorie Stoneman Douglas when this shooting occurred in 20. 18. How far removed from that high school were you at that time, Trevor? Well, I don't think that anybody who has been through this community was was even that far removed. Um, being a three-hour drive away, it was just one phone call from my brother who was uh, sitting in his classroom as everybody else was running away out the street. Um, just even the feeling of being the normal drive from school to home, um, I, I felt like I was a universe away. I'm um, seeing the news reports, seeing the tweets from 
the, the same place that my dad would drop me off every morning as I, I as I would walk into the same school building that was now on the front page of CNN and and all the major news outlets. Like it's 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 surreal, absolutely surreal. Right. So I, I actually answered my own question in my head as you were talking. If you're a senior in college now then you were two to three years removed. You had graduated two to three years prior to that. These shootings uh, at Parkland, uh, they, they caused something to snap, I think, at least momentarily and pretty violently in, in the zeitgeist uh, around the country. I think a lot of po- folks looked at that and said, enough is enough. And within moments, 800,000 people were gathered and marching on, on Washington, D.C., Combined with that, with combined with activism from people like you and from Manuel Oliver and the remarkable students uh, from Marjorie Stillman Douglas, who were all over the media in the aftermath of that, in 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 a more adult way than the adults, they were remarkable individuals. It looked initially like something would change. In your mind, Trevor, has something changed? You know, absolutely yes. So much has changed in in the past two years. Um, and when you talk about the activism of the students from Marjorie Stoneman Douglas and the 800,000 that we had in Washington, D.C., what I see are the students across the entire country, the 300-plus chapters that we have today of students um, from communities that are so different than ours, that are organizing every day against this trauma that has truly taken place over over young people across the entire country. Um, this is something that uniquely our generation has to has to confront. Um, when you look at like, the 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 prevalence of, of of gun violence in our schools, when you look at the amount of gun violence not not even just in schools but throughout our communities, this is something that our generation uniquely has to has to experience. When you look at twenty years ago. Um, Columbine, Sandy Hook, we're the first generation that's had to deal with lockdown drills ever since kindergarten. And now we're able, we're 16, 17, 18, 19, 20, um, we're able to use our voice and to do something with it. And um, I believe that what, what happened at, at my school, the, the timing of, of social media and um, the opportunity to do something with the 2018 midterm, like everything just just added to this massive um contentiousness that we had in society and and people all over the country did something about it it wasn't just the the students from douglas change seems to come in lurches if that makes any sense people things lurch forward two steps and they take a step back and maybe they lurch forward a, a step again and then they take two steps back it takes a while for change do you think change has happened uh as you travel the country Emmanuel? Uh, i do um i wish it would also show um a decrease in the numbers of victims that that I don't see yet, but but I do see an America that is emerging, that already is not okay with the gun culture. Um, I see them judging uh, mistakes that generations uh, prior to them made uh, by accepting this, mm-hmm. and I agree with them. Maybe that's why I, I get along so well with the, with the youth. That's, that's the only uh, uh, force that I really believe and trust. Manuel Oliver is the father of Joaquin Oliver, who died in the Marjorie Stoneman Douglas shootings in uh, uh, Parkland, Florida in 2018. He's the creator and the performer of Guac, My Son, My Hero, a one-man play which plays tonight in Charlotte. We'll talk about that play. And Trevor Wilde is with us, a graduate of Marjorie Stoneman Douglas and the organizer of March for Our Lives. It's Charlotte Talks on WFAE. Support for Charlotte Talks comes from WFAE members and Duke Energy, committed to increasing renewables, lowering emissions, and striving to be carbon neutral by 2050. More at duke-energy.com slash get more facts. And Central Piedmont Community College offering smart test prep courses for the SAT and ACT exam Saturday starting February 15th at a campus near you. Details at Collegiate Test Prep. Dot com. Tomorrow on this program, the trends shaping our city. Monumental change has impacted the city and the region in the past decade or two. Everything from new skyscrapers to rail lines to ballparks and new teams. We've gone from deep recession to being one of the fastest growing cities in the country. We're changing to embrace that growth and growing because we're changing. But there's good and bad with that change. And we look at that and peer into the future, too, tomorrow on this program at 9. 
There are roughly three million registered nurses in America, and the country needs more. Nurses now provide care that used to be reserved for doctors. Still, they're not always at the table when the decisions get made. I'm Todd Zwillick. How nurses are changing the face of American medicine. That's next time on 1A from WAMU and NPR. 1A from 10 to noon, right after Charlotte Talks on 90.7 WFAE, Charlotte's NPR news source. It's Charlotte Talks on Listener Funded, 90.7 WFAE and 90.3 WFHE. I'm Mike Collins. Manuel Oliver is with us, the father of Joaquin Oliver and the creator and performer of a one-man show about his son called Guac, My Son, My Hero. Uh, it's at the Underground tonight at 7.30. We'll talk about how this play came to be and what you can expect from this in a few minutes. Trevor Wilde is also with us, a graduate of Marjorie Stoneman Douglas. Uh, a graduate at the time of the shootings in February of 2018 and the founder and regional director of March for Our Lives. In the break, Trevor, Manuel Oliver uh, paid you a great compliment. He said, uh, you're a remarkable young person because you don't have to do what you're doing. He does because he's the father uh, of Joaquin, but you, uh, your brother was unaffected by this and yet you're at the front line of trying to make change occur. How do you explain that in yourself? Well, and I think Manuel talked about this a little bit ago, but when we talk about what we do and, and what happens to us and our reaction to what happened, um, a lot of us have so many different feelings. There's just a tremendous amount of grief and trauma in the community. But what I've learned and what I've seen through through past movements, through past um, past events and even American history, reacting out of love is the easiest way that we're going to make a change. And we need that change so desperately. And what we've seen from, from Manuel, uh, he his love for his son is so tremendous that he is going across the country sharing his message. And I believe that that has inspired uh, so, so many droves of children and, and organizers and youth to activism, to do something about it, to, to continue this love for for uh, Manuel's son, the love for their classmates, the love for their friends, the love for, for justice, and, and the love for change. And I think that when we root our organizing and we root our activism out of a love for, for out of love, we're able to make a, a change. Um, and we see this all the time where, um, like, our youngest, our youngest organizers, 15, 16 years old, like, they'll be feeling guilty because there's 40,000 people losing their lives every year to gun violence. Um, and they burn out really, really quickly, and, and they'll become, uh, at su such a young age, so in disbelief of the process. But um, when we see our organizers coming here because they love being with their friends, um, they love going out into the field and registering 100 voters a day and yeah. coming back all sweaty, um, that's the way that we're going to make a change, and that's what keeps me And, and it seems, Trevor, that young people have been particularly effective at this. This has been going on for a long time in the United States, and it finally took uh, young people, high school age people at Marjorie Stoneman Douglas, to, to really move the needle here, to prick the conscious, consciousness of adults whose job it has been to keep young people safe, and they failed at that job. Of all the groups who have ever demanded change, they seem to be having the most success. But it seems, at least from a 30,000-foot view, that that success has slowed. That could be my own misconception. Do you see this movement as having hit a wall, or do you feel that you're still making headway? Oh, absolutely not. We are, we are still making a change, and um, there's just different, different uh, lenses that we can look at this of. Um, in 2018, what we saw were images of... of um, students on the tops of cars with megaphones and massive crowds amongst them. Um, and in 2019, um, last year, I, like we, we saw everywhere, uh, like the Sunrise Movement and climate strikes, um, fighting for something that also affects young people. Mm -hmm. I mean, I believe that when, when we talk about an issue like gun violence, an issue that's so deeply rooted in so many injustices in American society. We talk about racial justice, where black students are more likely to be um, impacted by police violence, where in economic justice, where uh, in communities that have low funding of schools, they're also more likely to face an impact of school gun violence. Um, this is so deeply rooted in so many other issues that we also see activism and organizing around. And coming up, into one of the most important election times of, of all of our lives. Um, 
I think that we're seeing so many different outlets of organizing and activism, and all of these issues are so interconnected. Mm. In, in just the last few years, we have experienced the Sandy Hook shootings, the shootings at that Orlando nightclub Pulse, at the Marjorie Stoneman Douglas in Parkland, the shootings in Las Vegas, the shootings in Aurora, Aurora Colorado. Uh, we could spend the rest of the hour literally naming all these shootings that have gone on that have taken the lives of far too many people, including the attacks recently on synagogues and, and on churches. Uh, they all blur together for most of us. And as I said at the very beginning, it, it almost inures us. Things used to shock us. Literally, we would stop and we would be unable to go forward as we tried to process these tragedies. And now we just, it, it barely makes the headlines anymore. Uh, but certainly not for you, Manuel, uh, no. and certainly not for others who have been affected by this. Can you remember how you viewed these things prior to it personally affecting your life? Um, I guess um, I was uh, as ignorant as most of the people here in this country um, by not paying enough attention to this, mm -hmm. by thinking that it will never happen to me or my son. That's ignorance, honestly, because there's a big chance that it could happen to you. Um, on the other hand, and after being um, thinking a lot, thinking a lot, and I see how we uh, look at other nations and we, we feel that they are too dangerous for our citizens to go and visit them. So we warn them, hey, if you're going to Mexico, mm -hmm. you make sure you stay safe. Uh, no one is telling others that in here, in the United States of America, there is a big chance that you can get shot randomly uh, uh, or because someone hates you. Um, because a hundred people will die today. That's, that's a big number. So um, after all those thoughts, now I find myself in a place where I don't want to be an ignorant anymore. I know this is wrong. Some things are wrong. Some things are right. Killing people, killing between each other is not right. So we need to fight back that epidemic in, in, in any possible way. So you're traveling the country. You started traveling by, by painting murals uh, with messages from your son, and now you're doing this one-man show. When did you start the one-man show? I started uh, rehearsals, mm -hmm. and I quote <laughs> rehearsals. Well, build, you had to build the play from something. E well, I, the, the play is built from tragedy, mm -hmm. okay? Uh, I don't have a script, or I didn't have a script before. I had a story. And um, but I needed to to put it together in a way that someone could be sitting down for for 90 minutes and and still pay attention to it. Right. So then I got a lot of uh, human resources and, and advisors from the theater uh, industry helping. Yeah, me the people that. that came together to help you put this together and put it on on its feet and, and stage it are are remarkable. I mean, Leslie Odom Jr. from the cast of Hamilton, the original cast of Hamilton. Uh, the lyricist from Dear Evan Hansen and The Greatest Show uh, helped you uh, with this. All right. You brought in a director who's worked on both sides of, of, of the Atlantic to put this together. Why did they become involved? What was it about you and this project that made these heavy hitters, these are heavy hitters, it's, it's, come in and help yeah, you? Yeah, it's a funny story because I had no idea who they were. <laughs> and, I was, and I was invited by, by someone to New York in a small apartment so I could tell my story in front of a group of probably 12. Mm -hmm. But nobody told me who they were till, till I finished. So when I was done, they started introducing themselves. Because if they were tell me that prior me, I, I, I wouldn't be able to do what I did. Right. And, and to answer your question, you have no idea how many good people, talented good people, is out there ready to help, but they don't know how to help. So if you have the right thing that applies to the way they can help, mm -hmm. it's an easy step to, to get on board on the same page and do something. Today, I, I, uh, I work along with these guys, and, and we have a great product. When you go out on, on, onto that stage every night, where, wherever you may be in the country, and tonight you're here, uh, what are you hoping to achieve by the time the evening is over? I am bringing um, a conversation on stage. Um, 
I could be crying home. I have the right to do that. Mm-hmm. I have the right to do nothing. And no one's going to in any way blame me for that. But I also have the chance to go on stage and, and share with you the tragedy in a different way. So some moments, because my kid was such a happy kid, some moments you will be as happy as he was. And you're going to laugh because he was also a very funny dude. And then you're going to dance because we love music together. But you would also cry because we will talk about the tragedy. Mm-hmm. And you will also have an option because I'm going to mention a few calls to actions that maybe one fits you and you can start being part of a solution. Whose idea was this? Was this your idea to do this, to tell this, this story? Yeah, this was my idea. I'm, a, I'm an artist. I but can't did, help it. But was it just, would you have done this in the absence of the help of these people from the theater world in, in New York? Or? I, I would have done a, a terrible version of it. <laughs> maybe. <laughs> was, was the crafting of this play the rehearsal of this play, the performance of this play. Is it painful for you or is it a catharsis? It's painful. Um, we, every time we do this, and I always say we because my wife is my partner and my, my support. Mm-hmm. Every time we do this, keep in mind that we refresh what happened. So usually when you move on, you feel better because you move away from that tragic day. We decided to go in another direction. So it's not at all helping me what I'm doing tonight, but it will help someone. It might save a life, and that helps me. You say that you lost your son, but your son didn't lose his dad. You've talked about this a little bit. You say the work helps you be a dad to him every day. That's heartbreaking, but you also say that you wanted to look at people in their eyes. You want to connect with people, and you're telling his story as a way of connecting, but you're also sharing statistics with them. The statistics about these incidents are alarming. They are inexcusable. Uh, They are, many people don't know them, despite the fact that we, we experience this on a, on a daily basis now in this country. Every 50 minutes, someone... Every five zero, 50 minutes? 15. Every 15 one five. minutes. Every 15 oh. minutes, someone, in an average, someone will lose its life because of gun violence. Share some more of what you tell the audience. Well, I let them know, again, usually these venues can hold... In New York, we had like 600. Mm-hmm. So I, I was able to point at an aisle that had like 100 seats said, imagine this aisle starting to be empty, and every 15 minutes, someone will leave the room. In 24 hours, we won't have anyone on this side of the theater. Um, that happens, and we either ignore it, or, or we just take advantage of it if we are part of a problem. I'm talking about the gun industry right now. And these numbers change, obviously, almost every day. So, but at the last figure that I had, Each year, 36,383 people die from gun violence in this country. If 36,383 people died in airplane crashes every year in this country, we'd do something about it. Oh, yeah. With way less than that. Yeah, of course. Why don't we do something about this? Because, it and, and it's not news, and this is what offends me more, that this has been happening for years, and, and you guys have been here Looking at this reality where politicians and, and, and the gun industry align and, and there's a lot of money behind this, so, so you can keep on doing your business, which only only reason that is out there is that people is hurting each other. And, but these kids, the youth, the progressive, the new generation hates that, mm-hmm. and they get it, and now our, our politicians and representatives will need to follow our demands. I really see that happening. You're totally right. I could tell you this in, in, in another way. Joaquin was murdered 80,000 victims ago. Mm. Trevor Wilde, you know all these numbers, you know all these statistics, and I'm sure that you use them uh, in your advocacy for change, uh, both on the, on the, when you're marching and, and just behind the scenes when you're talking to people. 
What's your take on this? These are alarming numbers. They're inexcusable numbers, and yet very little movement takes place as a result of these numbers. Why, from mm -hmm. your point of view? For, for me, what I see is a gun lobby and a gun industry that has an absolute grip on state legislators across the country. Um, uh, talking about some of our advocacy back um, in 2018 and 2019, um, on a two-day notice, we organized a massive protest in our state legislator in Tallahassee, Florida, um, because the state legislator was about to arm, teacher, they, arm teachers. They were about to put guns in the hands of our history and our math teachers that, um, if you think about back when you were in high school, you know that there's a teacher that you definitely wouldn't want to have a firearm. <laughs> um, All my teachers. <laughs> exactly, yeah. exactly. And what we were immediately faced with was the fact that not only was the NRA and, and uh, the, the, the gun lobby here in Florida more prepared to, to increase their, their campaign finance, their campaign donations to all the Republicans that we have in the state house. Um, but the state legislator was more concerned with following direct orders from the NRA and even funding our school teachers. Just yesterday, I was in Tallahassee joining uh, the Florida Teachers Union with a massive 10,000 person um, rally crying for, for increased funding in public education. Here in Florida, we rank 48 out of 50 in terms of teachers' pay. Meanwhile, our state legislator would have given millions towards funding firearms for school teachers while our counselors are, uh, while we have one of the highest student-to-counselor ratios of, of, of any state. So um, when you, and, and, our, and your, st your state is not alone in that, in that push. Uh, oh, uh, North, uh, North Carolina falls into that c category as well. And I'm just wondering, is it really totally because you say they're in the, the control of the National Rifle Association, or is it more out of ignorance that they, it's easier to be tough than it is to be compassionate? It is easier to spend money on stuff than it is to spend money on human capital, counselors and teachers who, who might no. know what? Yeah, no. I, love is... is is a natural thing. And when we talk about like things like campaign donations, the, this, is, this, this is the crux of everything. Um, the NRA is able to fund the campaigns for people who will vote in favor of things that the NRA wants. And until we see um, the amount of control that the gun lobby and the gun industry has on our local legislator, um, we're not going to be able to make a change because, like, we can testify at every single committee hearing. We can share the stories of students under their desks while a shooter roams the halls, and we can share the stories of, of mothers and fathers who lose their, their, their children to accidental shootings. This is stuff that we did yesterday mm. at the start of our legislative session in Tallahassee. Um, everything that I just mentioned we did yesterday. And nothing will change. The, it will still be a, a split down party line vote. Um, and nothing's going to change until we get to the ballot box. And that's what we're organizing. That's uh, Trevor Wild, graduate of Marjorie Stillman Douglas, founder of, and regional director of March for Our Lives. He's here with Manuel Oliver, the father of Joaquin Oliver. More in a moment. Support for Charlotte Talks comes from WFAE members and First Citizens Bank. For over 120 years, First Citizens has been committed to helping families and businesses do more with the money they earn, save, and invest. First Citizens Bank, forever first, member FDIC. And Blue Cross and Blue Shield of North Carolina working on new ways to bring together physical and behavioral health care to address all aspects of patients' health. More at todaywe.com slash behavioral health care. The beginning of 2020 marks the beginning of the year of the nurse and the midwife. The worldwide effort is meant to highlight challenges that these healthcare professionals face, including long hours and a lack of public understanding about their professions. Coming up on 1A, they're going to debunk some of the myths surrounding nurses and midwives and discuss the challenges the industry is facing in 2020. That comes up right after our program 20 minutes from now, right here on WFAE. We're coming right back. Did you know that Charlotte is hosting the Republican National Convention? It's true. And on January 23rd, WFAE is launching Inside Politics, a new podcast hosted by Steve Harrison and me, Lisa Worf, about the RNC and the 2020 presidential race through the lens of Charlotte. Listen to the trailer and subscribe to Inside Politics now on NPR One and WFAE.org 
slash inside politics. It's Charlotte Talks on WFAE and WFHE. I'm Mike Collins. We're talking about gun violence in America through the eyes of people who are intimately involved in trying to change the paradigm. Uh, one of them is Manuel Oliver, the son, the father of Joaquin Oliver. His son uh, died in the Parkland High School uh, area shooting in, in 2018, and he's now the creator of and performer in a one-man show called Guac, My Son, My Hero. It's performing tonight, one night only, at the Underground at 7.30. We have information about that on our website. Trevor Wilde is also with us by phone. He's a graduate of Marjorie Stoneman Douglas and uh, founder and, and regional director of March for Our Lives. According to Mother Jones Magazine, which has done a deep dive into this topic, of the 143 guns possessed by the perpetrators of these mass shootings, and these statistics are a little old, so there's probably more than that now, more than three-quarters were obtained legally. What does that tell you about the challenge in finding a potential solution to this? I'm not sure which one of you should answer that question. Well, I think that describes the problem uh, in, a, in a very graphic way. Uh, this is not even a black market problem. The guy that murdered my son went to a store. He was able to purchase an AR-15. I don't know who needs that and what for. And, and, and large capacity magazines. The only reason that you will need that for is to kill people, as many people as you can in the less amount of time. And that is exactly what that person did. And that same study, Mother Jones, reveals that the majority of these shooters were mentally troubled and exhibited signs of mental health problems before setting out to kill. Is the answer easier access to mental health care? It's both, I'm, I'm sorry, Trevor, I don't know if you wanted to answer that, but I just want to say something that there's crazy people everywhere. Mm -hmm. I mean, um, I, I keep using the hooligans from England, you know, the soccer fans that are really pretty crazy and they do crazy stuff and they destroy places, but they don't have access to guns. So there's crazy people everywhere. There's video games everywhere. And only in America, they are a problem. Well, we have a Second Amendment in America that protects gun owners' rights and gives people the right to, 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 bear, to bear firearms. I know, Trevor, that initially your movement was pushing for common-sense gun control reforms at state and national levels. Is that still what you're pushing for? Is that still your mission? Oh, yes, absolutely. Um, when we talk about common-sense gun reform, I know that's a tagline that lots of people like to, like to tout, and then the NRA likes to to follow up, well, what does common sense mean? Um, and when we talk about the things that we can do to solve this issue, it's just tackling the root of the issue, which is injustice and a culture of violence that we have in our country. Uh, any number of polls have told us that Americans, by and large, favor what is called what are called common sense gun control, waiting periods, background checks, keeping guns out of the hands of individuals suffering from mental illness, some sort of reduction or control of automatic weapons designed for war, for killing people, not for hunting, but for killing people quickly, mass shootings. But policymakers seem unwilling or incapable of moving toward these solutions. How do you explain that? These seem, if, 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 if the majority of Americans are for this, and you're a politician, why are you in office? Simply to take money from lobbied interests? Is that it? Well, I think so. Have we lost our way in this country? I think so. Some, mo some of them, I mean, some politicians think that way. The, uh, what Trevor just said, every time we, we have a, 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 a conversation with either a member of the NRA or or someone representing the gun lobby, they will they play the dumb uh, person that doesn't understand anything. Like, and they always need you to define stuff. Like, well, define um, stalling uh, war guns. Yeah, it's well, a stalling now tactic. define uh, and come on, we, this is wrong, and, and you should understand these concepts. Uh, um, I think it's wasting time. Uh, I don't have time to waste. Uh, I have urgency to fix this. I have another daughter, and I have friends, and I have nieces and, and nephews, mm -hmm. and I really don't want anyone else dying because of gun violence. So I think we need to become a little more effective in, in the conversation. This is too traditional, what, what, what we are using here to talk. When we saw 
tens of thousands of young people marching in the streets because they are the ones who have been losing their lives in these mass shootings in, in schools and, and colleges and universities. They had an impact, I think, because of their own activism. It woke them up, but also because there's so much at stake for them. It would, was difficult for them to be ignored. You are the father of a son who lost his life in a mass shooting, and you're standing on the stage as you travel the country with your one-man play, uh, and you're not an actor. You're not an actor reciting lines. You're a father talking about his son in following his senseless death. What kind of impact are you witnessing as you look out in that audience every night and see the reactions of the people to your story? Yeah, um, one way to define what I do uh, that is not acting, it's, it's actually reacting. So uh, they, now they get it. Um, it's legit. It's my own story. And I see people uh, being concerned about me at some point. And, and I've seen people crying, but you don't have to feel bad about me. I don't feel bad about me. And when I do, I remember Joaquin that day. I remember my son dying. I didn't see this, but then I start visualizing options. And did he die fast enough to not suffer that much? Or was it a slow running out of air and blood, thinking about his mother and his father? You see how I can see your face right now while I told you that. I need to do this for Joaquin. I need to share this the way that I'm sharing it right now. So you have a graphic way of what's wrong. And I feel the impact. And that's the, I, I think that's the point that I'm trying to get to. Um, when you do this every night and you're having this impact, I don't know how many people are in the house, whether it's 80 people or 600 people or 1,500 people in a particular auditorium, you are getting through, it would seem to me. You are touching people directly. Does that have an impact? Is that what it's going to take? Touching people directly with a story they cannot deny. Yes, and besides that, there's two things. We have local groups on that same venue letting everyone what they do. So at the end of the show, you will have options to support. You don't need to buy a T-shirt from my organization. You can probably hang out with someone that is already fighting for that here in Charlotte. Because this is not about school shootings. This is not about Parkland. And I got it clear, and Joaquin has it very clear. Right. This is happening everywhere. Charlotte has had its own experience with mass gun violence. Last spring, on the last day of the semester at UNC Charlotte, two students lost their lives in that senseless tragedy, 19-year-old Reed Parlier and 21-year-old Riley Howell. Howell died as he tried to subdue the shooter, and he's been hailed as the hero of this event, but to his mom, he was her son. And since that day, Natalie Howell has started the Riley Howell Foundation Fund to support organizations that benefit victims of gun violence, and she joins us now for just a few minutes. Natalie, thank you for being with us, and I'm sorry for your loss. Thank you for having me. Your organization is still in its formative stages, but it is dedicated to helping victims of gun violence. You and your family are victims of that violence. Uh, what do you wish someone had done for you? Well, I first off want to say that we wish we hadn't had to start this foundation at all. I, I'm listening to your conversation, and I'm hearing you say, do you think it's compassion? Do you think it's um, being tough? And I think it's both. I think we have to take a hard look at what we're doing um, as a society and step back and make things better. So these kind of mass shootings and gun violence numbers uh, just don't exist in America. So let me just start by saying that. Um, <laughs> do you mean what do I wish someone had done for us in the immediate aftermath of Riley being killed? Yeah, because if, if, if your foundation is, is uh, uh, dedicated to helping victims of gun violence, uh, obviously you want to help right. them. What, what do you wish somebody had done for you? Well, I've learned so much about, about gun violence through this, and I think uh, there are so many different types. It's so daunting. Um, you know, suicide, mass shootings, uh, 
domestic abuse incidents, and it's really, uh, like I said, overwhelming. So trying to figure out um, the direction that we want to assist victims is, is where we are right now, how we can best do that. But as far as, as far as my family personally, my friends and family, it was critical for us to um, go immediately into uh, traumatic grief counseling. I think any loss is difficult, but especially a loss that is violent and unexpected. Um, it's just this lifelong trauma that we're, we're trying to figure out how to, how to manage somehow. So um, that was the, the number one step for us. And I, I've decided as our foundation member board that we would like to do that, how we can get immediate assistance to families and um, try to assist them in finding traumatic grief counseling, which is especially within the counseling umbrella. We, uh, we were talking to Manuel Oliver about his son, Joaquin, and about his, his one-man play, which tells Joaquin's story and their family story, and that, that seems to be one very effective way to get through to people so that they understand that something has to be done about this. Your son has been proclaimed a hero in this, in, in, in this instance. Um, talk to me about Riley. We have two. When Manuel talked about his son, Joaquin, he seems like a remarkable young man. Riley seemed like a remarkable young man. Talk to him, uh, to, to us about him. Riley was remarkable before that day. Um, Riley was, um, he was just uh, someone who got people at a very basic level and accepted people for who they were and, and always did even as a little kid he just sort of um, reached out to others and I know that sounds a little cliche-ish but it's just it's just who he was he had a big heart and um, he just if something was not happening the right way and he was around he was going to try to fix it and I mean that as far as how you treat people how you should treat others um, with respect and dignity um, and love so he his act that day was one of love, but I just want to say that he led his life in a way that um, was representative of, of that kind of compassion you're talking about uh, for others um, just regularly. You've said that... And I love what Manuel is doing. Just let me say that, too. I, I, I think that is... Um, I think the only way to, to... I think the way to try to get something done is to tell people stories, and Manuel is doing something absolutely incredible. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, uh, You're you, welcome. You've described Riley as uh, having had an, an altruistic nature that was fundamental to his character, and you just kind of described what he was like and, and how that played <laughs> out in his life. But where did that come from in him, do you think? Well, you know... Um, I think a lot of it, you know the saying, it takes a village. So he's, he lives, or we live, in this community where um, it's just a, a tight-knit small community in the mountains. And um, he went to small schools, and his teachers poured love into him. Uh, you know, he's got a huge family on both sides. And Riley was the oldest grandchild and the only one for a long time. So he got a lot of attention, um, like, just always, always felt like he mattered, and I think he carried that idea to other people, um, mm -hmm. and I think the same way when he would go try to find, uh, when he got older and went into, went into uh, the workplace, he, you know, he found families, workplaces that were families for him, and he just liked being part of, part of that part of the family. All three of our guests today, Natalie Howell, Trevor Wilde, Manuel, Manuel Oliver, have found um, have been touched by this senseless violence in America. And not everybody who has been touched, and there have been a lot more people than the three around this table today, uh, have the capacity, the ability, the time, the energy, the resources to start a foundation or to do a one-man play or to create uh, marches act and be part of an activist movement. What can people do who don't have those things to honor their their loved one to cope with their loss and to make a change going forward manuel i think they have to pay attention to our reality i think they have to consider themselves lucky to have their kids with them but not safe mm -hmm. 
So uh, supporting us, it's, it's, it's a good option. Uh, we have to do this with the support of as, as many as we can. And these are, in, in the three cases, um, um, non-profits organizations. So any help is always welcome. You help us, we make sure that we will help you. Uh, same question to you, Trevor. I think the easiest way that we can begin to tackle this issue is to just talk about it, talk about it with our loved ones. I mean, I'm as regional organizing director, I basically run a political campaign with 13 to 18 year olds. And one of the first metrics that we talk about is face to face contact. Um, we're going to spread this issue and awareness just by having those face to face conversations just like this. And, and Natalie, I have about 15 seconds uh, any any anything oh. to add. <laughs> I, I love what they said, communication, um, helping nonprofits who are trying to move this issue forward. I think if you um, are, are keeping your yourself safe, um, keeping others safe around you by making sure you're maintaining um, an environment where people don't have access who shouldn't, that would be wonderful. Natalie Howell is the mother of Riley Howell and the president of the Riley Howell Foundation. Trevor Wilde is a graduate of Marjorie, Stone, Marjorie Stoneman Douglas High School and the regional director of March for Our Lives. And Manuel Oliver is the father of Joaquin Oliver. His play, Guac, My Son, My Hero, is tonight at 7.30 at the Underground. Thank you all. Charlotte.